You're listening to the RE Social Podcast with your hosts, Andrew and Vince from OnV Invest. For more information, go to onvinvest.com. What's up, guys? Welcome to another episode of RE Social Podcast. Today, we have another Desi, which is Veena. How are you, Veena? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So for the, you know, a couple of people who haven't um, heard about you, can you give like a brief intro for like 90 seconds? Yeah, so I am Vina Jetty. I'm the founder of a company called Vive Funds. I'm a large multifamily owner operator. We focus on class B value add assets in the Sun Belt and Arizona. Uh, we have now transacted on just over $900 million in assets, but I am breaking the $1 billion mark this quarter. That is already going to happen. I'm on track. I'm really excited about that because I've been trying to get there for so long. Uh, I also am the founder of a Facebook community called Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty, where we kind of go over all things really entrepreneurship, but a lot of multifamily investors congregate there. And, you know, it's a community that we all help each other. And I'm really proud of that. That is awesome. And I think you do some philanthropy as well. Is that right? Yes, I do that as well. Um, I like to say I'm always raising money for something, whether it is multifamily or real estate or then my next charitable cause. Uh, last year, our community, actually, we did we did a grassroots effort to raise money to provide Christmas for underprivileged kids. And we gave 400 kids Christmas last year. It was over 400. I don't know what the exact count was. Um, and then we did last quarter, we also did a suicide prevention campaign and we did like a walk for that. So just community events like that. Wow. Love that. I love how you just like left that out too. You're so humble. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. We're very honored to have you as a guest on our podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if you see me in my phone a little bit, it's because I have all these like notes and questions and I might be taking notes as we talk. So I'm not texting. I'm actually taking notes. Um, speaking of notes, um, Arizona, is that yes. where the majority of your assets are? No, I actually don't have any assets there as of today. Oh. Uh, most of my assets right now, well, I'm mainly in Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina. Oh. Um, however, I am under contract right now on an asset in Arizona and one in South Carolina as well. The reason why I ask about Arizona is I was just there for the first time staying yeah. in like Scottsdale, Phoenix area, just yeah. having fun. I, w I was kind of, you know, checking out, you know, the Zillows and stuff and seeing what's out there. Um, Great you, market. You, you said you're looking to get into that market? Yeah, I'm under contract on an asset in that market right now. Oh, can you talk so, about it a little bit at all or no? I can give you very minimal information. I will say this. It is a nine-figure yeah. purchase. Um, so it's above the $100 million mark, which is one of the assets taking me over the billion-dollar mark. Uh, um, it's a pretty big asset. It's above 400 units. And wow. it's in one of the nicest zip codes of Phoenix. Wow. Okay. So, and it's a great asset. It's a great deal because it is a loan assumption. And it has sub 3% interest rate locked in for like seven years. It's amazing. Wow. That's insane. And this, how, how are you getting that interest rate? I don't know anything. So they, the seller has the interest rate in place from when they bought the asset. And now we're coming in, we're assuming their loan. So we'll get to leverage their loan already that's on the asset. Wow. Vince? So Vince is all. I know Vince is excited to talk numbers right now. <laughs> I know I'm gonna. I'm gonna go. I can. I can look at him and be like, "Oh, he's losing it." <laughs> um, he busts out a spreadsheet. He loves yeah. this stuff. No, I was just going to ask you, Vina. So, do you do like traditional LPGP splits, like seventy thirty, like a eight pref, and then just split the profits? Yeah. So we haven't done an eight pref in a while, mainly because we try to set the current cash on cash to the pref because it's just easier to understand, to track for investors to understand what's happening. Um, so right now we usually do a 6% prep. We are toying with it because we're starting to see cash on cash kind of a little bit higher nowadays. So we're actually looking at moving that up a little bit, um, but we do a very typical split 70, 30. So 70% to the investor, 30% to us on the promote. Um, and then we have what we call a home run hurdle. So if we hit a certain metric on the IRR, 
um, then we split 50 50. So after you return the capital, let's say with the refinance or something, do you uh, switch the uh, partnership to more 50 50 or you keep it at 70 30? We, we split to 50-50 once we hit our hurdle, which is typically an IRR metric. So it's product dependent, but generally, let's say we hit a 12% IRR, anything above that, we split 50-50. But that's just the cash flow, right? I was talking about the equity itself. On the equity. On the equity too, yeah. That's what Kenny does too, Kenny McElroy. Yeah. yeah. He kind of yeah. does that. Yeah, that's yeah it's a pretty cool. standard model. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, if you got uh, your... Uh, um, IRR that you promised, you know, anything after that is just, uh, it's pretty right. good. Yep. Yeah. Um, the prep model is very interesting because, you know, it kind of like, it makes it more difficult with the, nowadays with, uh, you know, the interest rate and the cap rates and stuff. So that's, that's very cool. Hey, but I did want to go back, you know, a lot of people listening, they're going to be like, yeah, 900 million, that sounds great, but I'm going to uh, turn off right now. That doesn't even make any sense. So yeah. how did you start? And I do, I do know your story. I know your mom's involved too in real estate. So how did you get into this? And uh, and what's the timeline like? Um, you know, did you start when you were five or, you know? Yeah, I mean six. No. Yeah, I'm six. Yeah. <laughs> she's she's a teen uh, mom. She's right. nineteen right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, bless you. It's just a lot of Botox. That's yeah. all. Oh, um, love that. <laughs> no, uh, so I was born into a family where my mom is a real estate investor. So my parents are immigrants, uh, you know, the typical immigrant story. They came here with like $26. They walked uphill to school in a foot of snow both ways growing up with no shoes, right? Like total mm -hmm. typical immigrant story. Um, but my mom started investing in real estate when I was little, little, I, I don't even 30, 35 years ago. And she's the one who really realized the power and the tax efficiency of being a real estate investor. And so my mom always invested in single family homes. And my sister and I were basically just raised in this entrepreneurial real estate environment. And I went to undergrad, you know, I got my degree in finance. I graduated when I was 20 years old. So I was really young. And my mom was like, great, now you can like come work for the family business. It's like, I'm an adult and I have a decree. I'm not working for the family business. I'm going to get like a real job, right? And she was like, all right, you know, go do your thing. And I went out and then I worked in corporate America for a few years. Ultimately in 2012, I paid taxes married for the first time. And, um, you know, my husband and I were both W-2 earners, which Anybody who's listening to this that's a W-2 will understand that it's not very tax efficient. The government and the IRS do not incentivize you to be workers. They incentivize you to be business owners. And so we paid a couple, a couple hundred thousand dollars in taxes the first year we were married. And I'd never paid that much in taxes before. So I call my mom and I'm like, mom, like, what just happened? They just took all our money. This is crazy. You know, whatever. And she was like, Vina? you need to quit your job and you need to be a full-time real estate professional and just invest in real estate. And I was like, yeah, I mean, like, obviously this is the answer. And so I quit my W-2 and started investing for myself, started buying single family homes like my family had. And I, you know, I did it on my own. I actually didn't do it with my parents. Um, I bought them myself. We bootstrapped and, you know, saved and did it the old fashioned way. And then there was a week where I bought five houses in a week. And I was like, wow, I really hate this, number one. <laughs> number two, it's not efficient. And number three, it's not scalable at all because I'm like sitting there doing the math. And I was like, if I, even if I kept up this rate of purchasing on single family homes and I bought five a week, I can only buy like 510 houses in or 535, I don't know what's 52 times five, right? And I was like, I can't buy that many doors. I can never buy 10,000 doors in a year or two years or five years at this rate. And so that's where multifamily and the power of multifamily investing really opened my eyes to this whole different world. And, you know, I thought that multifamily was for like Oprah and the Rockefellers and the Bezos of the world. I didn't think it was for regular people or everyday people. Um, but it is, and I think that's one of the biggest myths. And I wish I would have known that I could have gotten into it out of the gate. I would have entirely skipped single family 
and gone straight to multifamily. Wow. Yeah. So that kind of answers a question I always like to ask is like, if you could do anything differently, what would you do? So it sounds like you would have went right into multifamily. Yeah. And actually the more specific thing that I would have done differently that I didn't do and I haven't, haven't done is I never realized the power of being in the right rooms and like being in the VIP section at conferences, being in masterminds, being in these like private dinners that come with VIP rooms. Because I always thought I was, I've never paid for a mentorship. I've never paid for a mastermind. I've never paid for networking, right? Like a lot of them are pay to play. I never did it because I was always, I always had this mindset where I was like, I don't really need to know what NOI is. I don't need to go to this conference or pay for that. I can Google it. And it's true. You can, you can do all of that without ever paying for it. I did it. It took me over a decade to get where I am. So now I've earned my way into those rooms, right? Like I didn't pay for it. I earned my way. Like I have the resume and the track sheet that now I have a seat at that table. I totally underestimated what was behind those doors. And it's easily cost me millions of dollars, millions of dollars, because now I'm at those tables and I'm in those, even the text threads from the people that I've met at these places and the conversations are 1000% different and being around people who are better than you elevates you to be better. Yeah. And, you know, like I always talk about, like I'm in this text group right now and people at the end of last year, there were people that were like, Hey, can anyone, is anyone getting rid of one of their planes so I can buy it? Cause I have a tax problem to solve. Mm-hmm. I'm like sitting there reading this. And at first I'm like, ha, ha, ha. And then I'm like, oh, you're serious. Like you really (laughs) need to buy a plane in the next 30 days. Like I hate when that happens, right? (laughs) But that's the power of these rooms because now I'm like, oh, well, maybe I can get to a place where I'm going to buy a plane or maybe that's going to be a priority for me at some point, which I never would have thought when I was around people who had a limited mindset like I used to have. And so- I think people really just underestimate the power of proximity. Yeah. Being the dumbest person in the room is always. Yeah, absolutely. Game changer. And I think you guys are going to be meeting up at one of those rooms on Friday. Is that yes. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. You, you're going to be in the VIP, right? Yeah. Which mm-hmm. is where, you know, all the speakers are going to hang out. And that's where, you know, we're, I'm going to introduce you to all the other people in my network that are there and, that's how those connections grow. And that's how you're, it's so powerful. I totally underestimated what was behind these doors. I, I've had the same kind of journey just in my entrepreneurship, business, whatever, in just underestimating the value of people. Um, totally. It, I can just leave it as simple as that because that just covers everything from it does. who you partner with, this guy, who you marry, yep. uh, who you hire, who, yep. just, any, just who you hang out with even. Uh, everything those everything matters uh and, totally. and i i totally agree with you and i think that's a very common kind of belief is that oh well they're going to speak on this and that i can just google it which yeah we've yeah. never been at a better time now to just have any i mean i got a phone whatever i want to know like yeah you the can, actor like, in that 1964 TV. film i can find it in two yep. seconds right Yep. You know, chat GPT is really changing the yeah. access we have to great information, right? Oh my God. Yeah. But it's not that it's the P it's not who, you know, and it's not what, you know, it's who knows you. That's what's more important. That's the sound by. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that sounds like a Grand Cardone code right there. Yeah. yeah. You know, Grand Cardone. That's so true though. Yeah. That's, that's so true. true. And that's why you want to just pay for it and get in those rooms. And- yeah. Hey, Vina, I wanted to ask you this, uh, just to, from your point of view, you know, so you and I, we're both from India. I'm, my family is from Chennai, in, yeah. in, down in the South. So growing up in a, like an immigrant household, you know, somebody who's not from here, what kind of perspective did you guys have? And did they teach you like hardworking kind of stuff? Or did mm-hmm. they, because your mom is very different than most immigrant parents did. Yeah. They're not telling you to do like entrepreneurship, right? So no. how did that work? <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, um, I'm the black sheep in my family, my sister and I both actually, because we're the only ones with just bachelor's degrees. And, you know, I was the losers. rebel. Like, <laughs> you know, we're such losers, right? <laughs> yeah. And we're the only ones that are not like doctors or engineers or lawyers. We're the only like I did finance, which was like, 
you're going to go into business. That's so shameful, right? And my, yeah. my sister went into health services management. So she has like a health management degree. Um, and so, yeah, we're definitely the least educated of our family. But I think my mom really saw and understood the power of entrepreneurship. And, you know, my parents moved here so that my sister and I could have an opportunity at a better life, right? The American dream. And I think because my mom did so well in entrepreneurship, she knew and wanted to encourage her daughters to do the same thing. And I think that's the legacy that they wanted to leave behind. But, you know, I grew up in a very stable, loving, solidly like lower middle class, middle class household where we didn't have a lot of money growing up. Like some of the things that I do with my kids now, I'm like, this is crazy. Cause I, I never got to do this as a kid. I never, I, we didn't have the money we, or my parents didn't prioritize it. Right. Like a lot of my clothes were almost all hand-me-downs or secondhand clothes, right? Like my kids get new shoes and new clothes like every week. And that's really because like all four of their grandparents live really close by. It's not because I buy mm -hmm. it for them, but you know, these things are so expensive that growing up, my parents, they did not prioritize like me having brand new Nikes, right? They prioritized investing for our future and for their retirement. And both my parents retired early because they were so disciplined with their money. And, you know, the other thing I'll say is as the daughter of immigrants, my parents did not have the opportunity that we have today, one, because of access, right? Like now the internet's a thing, we have smartphones, we have AI, like everything has become so much more globally accessible. We have a lot of gig economy now. Um, so that's one thing, but also my parents didn't have a safety net here, right? They, they came here, their family was all back in India and if they failed here, they would have had to go back. So they didn't have the opportunity to make mistakes or take risks like my sister and I had. So I feel an obligation to take the chance that they gave us and go to that next level. And then, you know, my kids will probably just sell everything we own and spend <laughs> the money. I don't know. But, um, you know, that's that's kind of how I've looked at it. And that's really motivated me along the way, because. My parents literally had $26 and then they built everything they had from zero to, you know, millionaires. That's crazy. Uh, um, that's, that's really good stuff. I wonder if, um, that's always nice to know because I see that, you know, since I'm from uh, the same place uh, your, you, uh, your family is from, it's just uh, interesting to see the kind of drive people have because when most people come to the U.S., uh, the way I see it is there's a lot of drive. There's a lot of work they want to do. They want to really improve the community. So it's like it's very beneficial for a country to kind of get all these other people to come here and work and produce GDP. You know, it's, it's very interesting to see that. Totally. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go more into, so you you started you started understanding real estate. You bought, you know, five houses in uh five days and then you said yeah not for me and then you bought 900 million dollars of real estate so yeah. how did how did that transpire and how did, how much time did that take well so this must have been about almost eight years ago now okay um i so i we bought our first deal and i partnered with somebody who's still a good friend of mine today um and he's incredible really smart i partnered with him Is that cody no, actually, it's not Cody. Cody, okay. uh, he just partnered with me on our first multifamily deal in 2021. So it's only oh, been nice. two years. Okay. I wish he would jump in more. I think he's going to now. We'll see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I this was like almost eight years, eight-ish eight, eight -ish years ago. And we bought our first multifamily. And then I continued to go from there. Now, the first one we bought was... 15.9 million. And, you know, today we, that's a small deal for us. Like we wouldn't really look at that deal today because it just doesn't fit our buy criteria and where we focus our efforts. But at the time it felt like a really big, deal. it was a really big deal. It still is. But at that time it felt almost impossible until you do it. And then I remember in during COVID, we bought in 2020, we bought an $80 million deal. And that was the largest deal I'd done to date. And I remember my JV partner calling me up and saying, Kavina, um, 
do you want to buy this deal with me in Atlanta? And I was like, okay, how much is it? She's like 80 million, but it's almost 500 doors. And it was like $80 million. I was like, what do we need to raise on that? And she's like, you know, it's going to be almost a $30 million raise. And I was like, okay, the largest asset I bought before that was 52 million. So this is like significantly bigger. And I was like, okay, do you think anyone's going to want to invest? Cause you know, like COVID's a whole thing. The world shut down. She's like, I don't know. We're going to have to see. And I was like, okay, let's, all right, let's see. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I'm, we're the crazy ones that took a chance. And in 18 months, we almost doubled investor money in that deal because we exited it last year. And, you know, it was an incredible home run that, you know, is not going to be very typical, I think, in the future. But our investors were really happy. And it was because we took that risk. Uh, back in 2020 when no one was buying. So that was kind of the next big movement for me. And then, you know, last year we bought and sold our first nine figure deals. Um, we bought one at nine figures. We sold one at nine figures. And now it just feels more normalized. Just for people listening, I want to stress this point. Vina just said a $16 million deal is too small for her. <laughs> Drew and I's entire portfolio is worth eight million dollars. I just want you guys to realize what kind of difference there's, you know, like what levels we are at. So I just want you guys to not freak out and be like, if you think eight million dollars is too much, she just told us 16 million. She won't even look at that deal. That's the level. So there's always, you know, higher levels for you yeah. guys to aspire to. <laughs> there's always the next level. But yeah. you know what I'll also say too is the the smallest deal I've ever bought was actually my best returning deal I've ever bought. I bought it, oh gosh, when did I buy it? 20, maybe it was like around 2015, I bought a townhouse and it was in Dallas. I paid $21,000 for it. I got $850 a month in rent. I went to the property exactly one time. I wish I had never gone there because I was like, why am I here right now? There's like bars on the windows. This is crazy. Uh, never went back to it, but I owned it and I rented it out $850 a month. My mortgage on that was $116, including like my HOA fees. And then I sold it for 80 grand three years later on a seller finance and every month I still get a payment on it without having to do any of the management or any of the work for it. So, wow. you know, it's, um, it, it, don't overlook these small deals because that was the best IRR I've ever had on a deal. In, in the world of like, I don't think passive income is really ever truly passive. That might be one of the closest things though. Like, yeah. I mean, it, it was a, well, mm -hmm. when I owned it, it was not passive at sure. all because you know, you own a $21,000 property and you're charging $800, $850 for yeah. rent. I mean, you're like, where's your rent? Your rent is yeah. due. You're late on rent. <laughs> Especially Are you with rent? bars on the window tenants. Yeah, that's yeah, probably more was, likely. Yeah, different tenant base. Yeah. Um, but it's part of what I hated about owning single family is I don't want to call you and ask you about rent. I want my property management manager to do that. Right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I think in all passive income streams, always start off very active, very yeah. just like forward in terms of like you got to set all the systems and get everything in place. That's great. And I think that's also what's great about, you know, the structure that you and we use for real estate is one of the only truly passive income streams that I've seen. I mean, really purely passive, with the exception of maybe some initial docs that need signing or whatever. Mm -hmm. transfer is the people that we partner with uh, who have who have you know trusted in us who have seen the brand grow have seen the portfolio have seen the returns of their friends mm -hmm. say hey here's you know here's what i got here's what i want to see here's my goal make it work yeah. and then we make it work and i think yeah. that's when i when i figured that out i was like excited because then i realized hey i can win for me and my family i can win for you and your family yeah. Him and his family, everybody comes up as long as we've done our, of course, our due diligence and managed. Of course. Yeah. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. I love it. I love your video content about you. Uh, Cause I'm, I'm more of the CEO. I'm like, you know, operations management. I'm doing yeah. nine Airbnbs now, um, which is why I'm having this conversation at one 30 um, with the, the VA team. 
So uh, basically, I love watching that because you kind of go through and you talk about like, well, we could do this. Here's some neat little things. I did make a quick note. I wanted to ask you. Um, let me try to find it here. Oh, gosh. She's going to ask me about some video I recorded like a year no, ago. No, not really. No. <laughs> You're like, I don't know what's going on. What, what video did I record? I know. <laughs> here we go. Yeah. So as a host of nine Airbnbs myself mm -hmm. um, in the across like 30 units that we have, I personally really enjoy your content about how you would upgrade certain aspects of homes. So what are some common mistakes and or maybe easy upgrades that you would suggest a newbie investor with mm. like fixer funds? Oh, this is actually a really good question. Did you say that don't have a lot of funds? Yeah, like okay, budget. Super easy. Okay, first and foremost, do not over improve your asset. This is so common. I have looked at so many deals where they're like granite and stainless steel, but then the area median income is like thirty thousand right. dollars. You're not going to get the ROI on that, right? So don't over improve and do not spend so much money that you need to get a post renovated rent or income that is not sustainable for the area, right? So generally the rule of thumb is we like three X income to justify the rent. So if I need a thousand dollars in rent after I renovate, then the area median income has to be a thousand dollars times three, which is $3,000 a month, which means there has to be a $36,000 income in the area for me to justify a thousand dollars in rent. If it's 2000, you double it, right? So don't over improve. That's number one. If you are going to improve, the first thing we do is, and this is probably for more commercial assets, but we do, we restrike the parking lot and we power wash the buildings. It lets the tenants or the residents know that there's new management. We care about the community. It's going to be beautiful. We're going to take care of it. We know this is your home, but also it gives you better curb appeal, right? So now you have much nicer looking assets that nicer tenant bases are going to want to come and live there. The crime rates are going to reduce, the pollution or littering is going to reduce. So it's not necessarily direct to your bottom line, but it is indirectly impactful to your profit and loss. Um, as far as any Airbnb or multifamily assets go referrals. If you have good tenants and you have good renters or people that stay there, ask for referrals because guess who's in their network? Probably people like them. Yep. So referral programs you can implement for virtually free. Um, yes, you can take a little bit of a haircut on pricing or referral fees or whatever that is, but don't overlook the cost of a bad tenant versus the cost of a good tenant. Um, and then on multifamily, especially, and this probably doesn't work so much on the Airbnb side, but on the multifamily side, uh, parking, that is one of the easiest revenue generators that you can add to any multifamily asset is reserve parking, covered parking, depending on your market, your residents will likely pay for it. Um, especially now with everybody like working from home, they want to be able to park it somewhere where it's close to the front door. They're bringing groceries in. It's covered if it's in an area like Dallas where there's a lot of hail. Um, so really knowing and understanding your market there is going to be game changing. If I were to own and run Airbnbs, I would add ancillary services right off the bat. Um, what that means, because like when I stay in an Airbnb, I want my fridge fully stocked and I'm willing to pay you to go and pick up all my groceries and stock my fridge because I have young kids. I don't want to get there and not have any snacks available, right? So like if you offer to get groceries for me and have it stocked so that when I walk in, I don't have to worry about any of that, I'm willing to pay for that service. Um, and I spoke at Rentalpreneur last year. I'm going to be speaking there again this year, which is a short-term rental conference um, thrown by TJ Tajani, who's amazing at short-term rentals. And uh, when I was there last year, I got to meet the founder of Hostfully. And I'm sure you guys use something like this, but what they do is their uh, revenue optimization. And so what they'll do is they will look at, okay, Vina, there's somebody checking in today, they're checking out tomorrow, and then there's another person that's coming on Thursday. So you have that one day gap. And so what it will do is it will automatically price and reach out to the person checking in today and ask, do you want to extend your stay for an extra 50 bucks or 30 bucks or whatever that discounted rate is? Because it's empty anyway, you might as well generate revenue from it. And then if they say no, then it'll reach out the, to the person checking in and say, do you want to 
to move your stay one day earlier for a discounted rate. So now you're optimizing your stay. And I think that on average, they see about a $500 a month increase in revenue for people that utilize that software, which is really powerful. Cause that's, that's really you know, cool. I will be listening. Yeah. I'll be re-listening to this podcast just to <laughs> grab that little bit. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's incredible. And it's a woman started tech company, which I also adore because women in tech oh, are very rare. Love it. Yeah. Coming from a powerful woman yourself. Actually, I had a question on that as well. Wow. We have so much to get into. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Have you thought about investing in real estate and taking advantage of all of those benefits without any of the work? That is something that Envy Invest not only provides, but has been providing since its inception. With friends and family, we have built an empire in a system of a wealth generating tool that is giving us and our friends and family that leverage in their life to create true wealth. Go to envyinvest.com for more to see if you qualify and thanks for listening love that man what a good little nugget i'm like totally going to be doing that i use hospitable and price labs myself okay um, i don't know to... anything about these things i told you everything i know about airbnb just now. <laughs> right there in one shot <laughs> man i love it um yeah, you had mentioned in a recent um, post about how, you know, it's just there's just natural disadvantages to being uh, a female in this like male dominated mm -hmm. sector that is real estate. Um, and, and and I can't speak on it, but I could probably see how that is true, being yeah. it's like 99% guys, yeah. with gray hair and stuff. Um, yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but yeah, I could definitely oh. see how that's true. My question to you is to play devil's advocate. Are there any, if any, are there any advantages? Many, like many what? advantages. Um, so one thing I'm really excited about, and I was, it's funny because as you were saying that, I was like, yeah, there are, there are a lot of disadvantages, but there's a lot of advantages too. Um, when I am, I've been raising capital, right? And when I'm looking at our KPIs, we track a lot of KPIs closely. Um, what I've noticed is in over the years, I've had an uptick in women investors, so only 31% of investors today are women, which obviously we have a long way to go, but we're making progress. What I love is that I have women, some of the most powerful women invest with me because they go, I, I had, a, I'll tell you a great example. I had an investor. She is a super specialized surgeon in her field. And, you know, I'm on a call with her and she's like, you know, I'm so glad that I am talking to you and I can invest with you because I've interviewed and I've talked to a lot of men in this space. And she's like, and I feel so intimidated by them. I'm like, you're like one of like five surgeons in the country that does what you do. And you're intimidated by somebody. This is crazy to me. And she's like, yeah, because they are condescending to me and they talk down to me immediately. And she's like, you don't do that. You make me feel comfortable talking about finance and something that I didn't learn in school. Right. She spent all of her time training to be this super specialized surgeon. And she's like, I didn't learn this. And I feel dumb asking these questions. And I don't have anybody that I can trust to ask these questions. And I love that about investing with you. So I just love that we have the advantage of being able to speak to women more, have more women investors. I also get a lot of feedback from men who say like, I just love that there's a woman in this space because my daughters have someone to look up to. My wife, I want her to love real estate and I couldn't get her interested until she saw your content and you break it down and you make it relatable and easy to understand. And, you know, we do a lot of discussions, like in my Facebook group, we do a lot of Zooms that are not just technical information. We do a lot around mindset. How do we balance everything? Earlier today, I had, um, so I have an organizer that comes into my house and like throws away all the things and organizes all the things. And I was talking to her, I was like, I would love for you to come on a Zoom with my community and just give everybody tips on like how to be better organized because we all could use that, right? Like not just women, but I think it's something that a lot of the men that are in this space don't necessarily add that holistic element of just living like a good life overall. And I, I'm excited yeah. to be able to do that and make that impact in that way. That's great. And and now to speak selfishly back to my Airbnb yeah. stuff, because I, I actually yeah. really do love it. Um, I actually have my mom Hmm. I mean, she and this the, our ninth launch. She took the ball because I was in Scottsdale. 
mm-hmm. for the weekend, just just you know, playing, yeah. you know. And uh, I called my mom. And I was like, "Hey, mom, I'm gonna be gone on this little trip. Can you keep running the ball for me? Because it, it's just so many things involved: the deliveries and the furniture yeah. and the vendors and the junk haul. There's so many components." And she's done it with me for since maybe the third or fourth Airbnb, like going with me to Target, filling up three carts and like having the eye for design. And what I love about her is she has that, I guess I'll call it a female touch. It's just something I I know that I need. I need a woman to walk this and tell me where I'm messing up because I'm just a guy and I know I'll miss things. I know there's something that's like, oh, yep. Yeah. She does that every time. She'll find those little. Love things that. that will just improve, make it more homey, more inviting, make the pictures pop, make the guests feel more excited. And, and it's so awesome to have her help me in that way. And also that. to keep it in the family is fun too. So she gets sure. to come up with me and see the success and be involved and feel that pride. So yeah. I, That's amazing. I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. The, the female touch I think is um, extremely necessary, especially in the hospitality industry. Mm-hmm. As someone who, again, back to you know, going with the whole Scottsdale Phoenix thing, the Airbnb I stayed in was for sure, man, it just could have stood to improve a lot and have more of, yeah. dare I say, a female homey inviting touch. Okay. It was very like bare bones, like furniture, TV. And I saw the pictures I knew I was getting, but it was just like very vapid and just un, it, it was, um, it wasn't exciting for yeah it's just a place to sleep it's fine um yeah you could, tell, you could tell that you know that needed that extra push I totally agree I mean I've stayed in my fair share of Airbnbs now and I'm like I really wouldn't have done it like this yeah mm-hmm. yeah and I try to take notes of those you know and learn from others and say okay yeah. well, here's where mistakes were made I just did a video actually like right when I got there in the bathroom I'm just like from every square inch of like what's going right, what could be improved. So when I saw your content, I was like, oh, cool. So I'm doing something right. Like Avina's is doing it. I, I, I'm on the right <laughs> then I should do it too. <laughs> I should do it. Well, I didn't even know. I, I didn't even watch your content when I did it. Oh, um, but funny. I was like, okay, at least I know now, like, this is cool. And I can double down on that and like go mm-hmm. stay in other places. And for the next renovation, talk Love about it. what's, you know, easy fixes and I love the power wash comment too. That's something that we've done for a couple of properties. And it's just like, where we even considered painting them because they just look so, you know. Yeah, but it's like such a cheap entry point into making it nicer. And it really does make a difference. Yeah. Especially if it's like a few years old, like it gets dirty. Yep. Um, you know, another one I really like actually is, and I feel like people don't do this and I don't know why, but backlit mirrors Oh. It's so incredibly cost effective to put a backlit mirror in a bathroom. It like you can do it for like 200 bucks for a decent size mirror. And it is just such a luxurious touch. And, you know, for women, we like that because it helps with like doing our makeup and our hair and just getting ready. It has more of that like spa feel. Yeah. And some hotels do that now. And I'll tell you, like, anytime I stay at a hotel with a backlit mirror, I'm like, oh, I love this place. And then, and it makes us look way better than we actually look without the backlit <laughs> mirror. So it's like, you know, the confidence boost and you immediately have this like positive association. So I think everyone personally should invest in the backlit mirror because it's incredible. It makes a huge difference. You know what? I'm going to put one in my bedroom. So it's going to go well with the dates. That's what I have to do. <laughs> She's right. <though. laughs> just just everywhere, just string lights. Yeah. And just like backlit mirrors. Amazing. I love it. I love it. Yeah. No, that's so great because, and you know, I think for, for me, if, if a place can fit a king size bed, mm. do it every time. Yes. Um, people want to feel like, you know, luxury. Luxury. Yeah. yeah. And that's great. Backlit mirror. You're throwing me some. Gems. Thank you. Hey, you know, I wanted to touch on something real quick before I forget was the stuff, you know, with the modern stuff, you know, everybody's getting canceled for everything. So it's like people are so scared of even saying anything. And I can even tell like when we speak, we're like, but there's like nothing wrong with having like a, 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 a women being something better at something and men being some 
better at something, right? Like, like you will be maybe better at uh, doing the decorations for uh, um, the interior design for Airbnb, but there's no way in hell that you will be able to carry more things than me because I'm just bigger, stronger, just taller. I'm, I'm, you know, so different skills for different people. So like even between like Drew and I, like, you know, he does the Airbnb interior stuff. I'm more analytics, you know, like market yeah. research. So, you know, people shouldn't always think uh, that, you know, everything's got to be equal. Oh, if I did this and then it's a gender role, you know, don't freak out. Just, you know, do whatever is good for you. And, you know, if you're really good at something, you should just do it. Whether you're a girl or a guy, who cares, you know? Okay. I have to challenge you a little bit on that. Okay. Okay. First and foremost, you'll be sorely disappointed if you ask me to decorate or design anything. Yeah, okay, that's I fine. Like the worst taste ever. Yeah. Um, so I hire people for that because people are like, mm -hmm. oh, what color do you want to paint in it? What's your favorite color? And I'm like, whatever makes me the most rent, that's my favorite color. I don't care if it's blue mm -hmm. or green or brown or black. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Um, but what I would challenge you is, mm -hmm. okay, so in this example, right, you're like, I am going to be able to like carry more stuff and reach higher. I'm pretty strong. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, but really, it's that's true in like this interaction and this exchange. Sure. But there are women that are stronger than you, right? And yeah. that's that's just the reality of it. And so I think the problem is, is when we default to these gender roles and these gender stereotypes that women get displaced out of the decision making suite. And that's what the problem is. And I'll give you a great example. Mm -hmm. I was walking an asset that we were under contract on. Okay. We were already under contract. They had sent the junior broker to do like a walkthrough with us. And I walk in, I introduce myself and it's like some young dude. And he immediately mm -hmm. goes, Oh, so, um, and I said, I'm a partner. I'm buying this asset. I'm a partner. And he goes, okay, when is your husband getting here? Mm -hmm. How many times have you been asked if your wife or your girlfriend is showing up to a business meeting? Yeah. Zero right yeah. that's not the only time i've been asked that. i've been asked that many times mm -hmm. and i go i mean you know i'm a little snarky so i was like well did you tell him about it because i didn't so it'd be weird if he just showed up like that mm -hmm. and <laughs> you were like so well then who's buying it i was like i just told you that i'm buying it yeah and they, without your husband and i go well where's your wife why isn't she here you mm -hmm. know like it's just so ridiculous that people would assume that my husband has to be involved for me to buy this deal. And it was, you know, it was a tip for today. It was a little bit of a smaller deal than what we would do today. But at the time it mm -hmm. was it felt big. It was like a $40 million deal. And small deal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he was just shocked. And so I challenged the gender assignment of who is a decision maker and what our strengths are and what our roles are, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I love that. Yeah. That even Ashley, uh, sorry, go for it. No, no, go ahead. No, we had Ashley Wilson here. I don't know if you know her. She's a multifamily. Uh, oh, yeah. So she was talking a lot about it. And she was saying um, that people will immediately ask about how is your, uh, you know, family life or like kids, you know. And then like nobody will ask me or Drew about kids. Um, you know, that's kind of um, um, weird. Of, of course, people ask Brandon Turner that all the time because he brings it up. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, but it is the gender assigning kind of roles, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that and I think that women are better at some things, but I don't think it's because we're inherently better. I think it's because we've been trained this way from a very sure. young age, right? Like girls, by the time they're eight years old, they are discouraged from being in STEM. That's mm -hmm. a big problem because STEM is where the money is when it comes to jobs and roles. And I think too, like if you just look at the, the gender disparity in terms of like pay scale, there's a reason why it keeps coming up that women are paid less than men in the identical fields, right? Yeah. So it's not like, oh, okay, women are just, they choose to be teachers. No, they're molded and pushed in that direction from a very young age. It's not that they're just inherently better. Like men are equally as capable at being in those same roles in those same positions in society, they're just not conditioned that way the way women are. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd agree. Yeah, I love that you're you know you're creating a, a rift in that, and you're going into it. You're a powerful woman, Thank inspiring. You. Hopefully, his nieces to one day. I know Tanya, you better be listening. This episode's for you. <laughs> We're sending this to Tanya. This yeah. is listening homework. Yeah, my 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 favorite people are my mom. Uh, her name is just one letter away from yours. Her name is Mina. 
and then my Nina, sister, hey. and then yeah, and then my my sister Reshmi, and then I have two nieces, and Nehara and Natanya. So I'm gonna yeah. push this episode on them. Better listen to Vina, guys. Love it, yes. And then you know, come and work with me in the future. We need more women in this space. Yeah, she's the yeah. Tanya is super smart. Yeah, yeah. Get Love her it. get her reading now. Hey, speaking of that, yeah. If we were to tell uh, his nieces to start reading something now, what would you tell them to read? How old are they? Uh, Tanya is uh, 16, going on 17, just like oh. Sound of Music. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> some uh, I, I would sing it, but I told you before the show that I'm actually <laughs> a bad singer and I got fired from my singing lessons. So I, I will spare all of you. Uh, when I was that age, my parents made me read this book. I think I was like 14. They made me read this book, The Millionaire Next Door. Have you guys heard of this? Oh, yeah, of course. It's yeah. Classic, right? So they made me read it. And it was is that like, Gary? Is that Gary Keller? No way I would know. So uh, I can't remember who wrote it. His daughter just wrote the updated one. The new it's either one. him or or Stanley or something, right? His name was I forget. Yeah. Terrible with authors, but that's a great no, book. I'm yeah. so bad at remembering who wrote what. I was on a podcast the other day, and they were asking about a book, and I'm like, I don't know. And thankfully, I have it right here, so I could tell you the name, but I can't. It's behind like a screen, so I can't actually see it. It's here. Um, but it's a great book for just starting out and understanding. Thomas like, J. Stanley. Stanley. Okay. That's what I thought it was, but I wasn't yeah. sure. And so um, why would you recommend this book? It's a great catch all for like basic finance and why it's even important to understand personal finance. And it talks about like under accumulators of wealth and prodigious accu accumulators of wealth and like which one you really want to be and what you have to do to get there. It also talks a lot about the habits of millionaires because especially in today's social media age, it can be really hard you think like, okay, this person has like a Rolex and a Lamborghini. And it's like very pervasive in our culture to think that that person is rich. But the reality is, is you don't know if it's rich, they're rich or not, right? Like I was in the car with a friend, um, Pace Morby actually. And he's like the king of creative finance. And we were going to dinner and he pointed at a car and I can't remember what kind of car it was like a McLaren or something like that. It was like a fancy half a million dollar car. Right. And he goes, Oh, look, those people, somebody's got money here. And I said, no pace. Somebody spends money here. <laughs> and he was like, Oh my gosh, you're totally right. I was like, we are literally driving in a Prius, you and I. And <laughs> More pace so drives mad. a Prius. Oh, he loves his Prius. Oh, my he God. Loves this his is Prius. ridiculous. Prius. This yeah, guy owns like three, four hundred million dollars of real estate. Yeah. And I'm like, OK, so he we're driving in this Prius and I'm like. If someone were to look at our car, nobody would be like, I bet you that car controls almost one and a half billion dollars or more in real estate. Yeah. Right. They're going to be like, oh, OK, that's the poor person in the Prius, the sensible car. Sure. Whereas we we look at the McLaren or whatever it was and he's like they've got money and it's like wrong they spend money maybe they have money it's possible right but maybe that's all they have and we all know cars are liabilities you'd be a guy just trying to like impress a chick you know absolutely <laughs> i mean listen my husband bought a porsche like four days before we met in person so ah. <laughs> oh it worked for him that's why guys porsche a great investment oh my you god it is a billionaire not. Wife? that's the way get a porsche Beautiful, i hate the porsche life. yeah porsche got porsche. it porsche. got it okay no <laughs> That's great. So let me play. You know, let me challenge you a little bit then on that. Yeah. Um. Because Vince and I were just kind of discussing. So we've been doing it for five years, and we promised not to touch anything until five. And now it's kind of around okay. that time. We just bought a car yesterday with oh. this business's cash, which was great, and we are definitely going to be bragging about that. I love it. What do you um, buy? It's nothing fancy. It's just like a little Mustang with a drop top, just something that's fast and red and ridiculous. That um, sounds fancy. Yeah, yeah. Still fairly reasonable, actually, um, compared to what I was looking at. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, point is, I'm telling him, I'm like, hey, man, we should consider just like, you know, you know, maybe having a little nice watch. Like, he's got yeah. some Louis Vuitton scarf that gets a lot of compliments. Okay. And I'm like, these things actually, I don't care about having the fancy. I don't even know what fancy shoes are, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I have like some. I have some Italian like leather boots that are actually kind of nice and pricey. They yeah. always get compliments. So yeah. I, I, 
point is this, as somebody who is like raising capital is your thing. Do you recommend what well, just tell me? Oh, tell she's me, got some insights. Me, please, so take she's got it. And tell me the truth. Okay. There is balance to everything, right? I think in general, most Americans live outside of their means. And I think most Americans try to keep up with the Joneses, right? They're trying to buy what their neighbor has. And listen, lifestyle creep is real and it is strong. Um, so I think it's hard sometimes to kind of try to balance that. But what I can say is the more and more successful you are and the more and more you can afford to buy these things, the less and less exciting it is for you to own them. Like it just, for me now, I used to always buy a bag every time we closed a deal. Like that was one thing I did to celebrate. Like, so we donate to charity and then I'd buy a Chanel. That was like my thing, right? Now I'm like, well, I could buy the Chanel or I could spend that money and like take my kids on a weekend experience somewhere, or I can buy a zoo membership for a family that might not ever be able to do that. And so I think they just lose their luster a little bit. Like, I don't think you should show up homeless and, you know, without like, you know, clean cut, you know, shower. These are really simple things you can do, but I don't think it necessarily is important to drive like the Lamborghini, uh, you know, like I have a Kia that I absolutely love. Uh, we have fancier cars too, but I love our Kia. Pace will tell you the same thing. He and I like are both nerds that love our Kias, but the Prius is his favorite car. Um, you know, we're just, we're not really that worried about the stuff as we are on the impact and what we can actually do and how we can change the world. Love it. Now, um, to play devil's advocate though, well, I'll just say this. You are, you and Pace are obviously a very established brand. If you yeah. At this point. So I don't need to see what you're driving to know. Hey, doing a deal with Vina is obviously a great choice, you know? So yeah. for somebody who, I mean, for us, we've been in this five years. We've got a great track record, really great brand. And we are starting to hit this kind of stride where we have these meetups and people just come up to us and say, hey, I want to do something. Here's what I have. What is, is this okay? Like, do I qualify? Yeah. And I love that, that we're not really asking at this point. However, we do want to scale. We want to be talking mm -hmm. to those surgeons who they just know spinal surgery and are making all these millions and they want it to work for them. Yeah. We have the perfect vehicle for them. Yeah. But my question is, do you think having a nice watch or a nice suit, does that matter? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I think having a nice suit is always a good thing, but okay. do you need to spend $2,000 for a nice suit? Probably not. Gotcha. Um, I'm as an investor myself, I'm far more impressed with someone who lives within their means and knows how to manage their money than the person who is scraping by to pay for their car payment. I don't, right. I would rather you be like driving your Prius and then you have liquidity. So if my the asset I'm investing into needs extra capital, you have the money to do it. Um, so I don't actually think, and I think too, it's a, a misconception that rich people do these things. Like I, they just don't like, I, we have billionaires that are invested with us and it's so funny. Like they drive like trucks and I'm like, what's happening? They're like, Oh, well, I'm not going to spend money on that car. Like they think it's absolutely absurd that someone would spend half a million dollars on a car. Right. So it's, there's levels and when you can't afford it or when you're starting out, I would much rather have someone who is a good manager of their own money. Cause then I know they're going to manage my money. Well, right. Yeah. I love that. And that goes right back to the entire message. You basically, you basically just gave everyone the whole thing on millionaire next door. That is the overall yes. message, which is, yes. yeah, that is literally the message. Yes. Live within sure. your means, but you know, all these millionaires who you wouldn't even know are sitting on a lot of net worth and very well living. And that's the majority. Yeah, totally. And it's it's just less stressful, right? Like yeah. when COVID hit, I didn't once worry about the financial implications of, you know, hospitals being shut down and businesses being shut. I didn't care. I didn't I didn't even notice it, honestly, in, in our accounts or our lifestyle. We didn't change anything. Yeah, that peace of mind. I mean, you can't put yeah. all that on that. You're right. Totally. Uh Vince, do you have anything to say? I'm kind of talking a lot. 
No, no, it's good. It's good. Uh, I, I would say most overall message from Vina is like it's more balanced, right? So um, I think uh, like a nice $500,000 suit, uh, that's definitely something I would wear. I, I do have those. But having like a five ten thousand dollar watch is not even exciting for me, so I wouldn't care. But I do like the the red Mustang; it's kind of cool. So yeah, you gotta no. see see we are smart, Vina, because that's what happens when you have an Indian friend like me. He <laughs> wanted a brand new GT Mustang, sixty thousand. We ended up buying a used uh, a turbo Mustang for like twenty five Gs, which is really amazing. Good. That's amazing. I I like really don't care about cars at mm -hmm. all because I hate driving. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, I'm totally not the person to ask about cars. I'm like, yeah, Kia's are great. Yeah, Mercedes are great. This is great. That's great. Like, I don't care about yeah. it. Yeah. Here's here's why our purchase just is kind of speak selfishly again. Sorry, Vina. No, I think, tell me. I, I think here's why what we just did yesterday was a very big win, because I do love driving and uh, I love American Muscle. My dad had an auto body shop with all these Challengers and all the you know, it's in my. Yeah, these, I tell you, Vina, these white people from Kansas we love it. it. <laughs> love it. American muscle. Anyway, so American muscle cars. I mean, I believe you. I, I just love driving don't this feel car. this in my heart. I feel just great driving this car. It give, it energizes me to drive this car. And it only goes, it's only like 300 and some odd horsepower, which is I don't know. quite a it's 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 all I need. I know that. Okay. And it and it has comparable uh uh miles per gallon, you know, to what I was driving before, which is a little Sentra for years. So, but here's the best part. I love it. Best part is we paid for it with our business cash. I love that. See, yeah. so that is like the fruit of your labor, right? I think yes. that there's the balance of being frugal, saving, getting to the next level, and then living within your means. So like yeah. maybe right now you could go out and buy a $150,000 car, but you bought a $25,000 car. And we definitely yeah, could. Love it. Yeah, yeah, and you love it. And that's the utility of it. Like for me, I just don't care about cars. So I'm probably never going to understand why this is so exciting for you. But I know that my husband loves his car. Like he loves his car and it makes him so happy and I'm happy for him. But like, I want an experience, right? So like, I will prioritize food over everything. <laughs> I will go to a Michelin star restaurant and I will spend 500 or a thousand dollars to eat a really amazing meal that I might not ever get to eat ever again. And there are some people that look at me like food is just like a sustenance source. This is not to be enjoyed or experienced the way that I feel it is. So, but that's the nice thing is when you make enough money, you can prioritize the things that are important. So I love that you got your American muscle car. Yeah. So that's my thing. That's what energizes me. Yeah. And also, I mean, food. Oh my God. Yeah. Spending a little bit on a great steak or oh. something. Oh yeah. Yes. The tomahawk. Yeah. That's how I celebrate our closes is I go get a tomahawk steak. Get a tomahawk. Yes. I, you know, I don't, we don't like really do any specific meal, but we do celebrate. Yeah. You have to, you got to celebrate those wins. Yeah. You got to celebrate the wins. Keep throwing merry going. Exactly. Now, speaking of, I want I got, I got one more, one more question. I promise. Okay. You're doing, this is also like promotion for what you're doing. There's a cruise coming up in May, right? Yes. Yeah. About that. I have a two part question. So okay. by the way, to, to plug Vina's, you know, what she's got going on, there is uh, this cruise going from, I think was a Palm Beach to the Bahamas. Yes. Right. In the, May 15th to the 17th. Yes. And uh, this is 2023, by the way. So if you're listening to this, yes. episode, sorry. <laughs> um, and you're speaking on that. Uh, what question one is, what is the topic? What are you speaking on? I'm going to be talking about raising capital. Love so if you are trying to scale your business and raise capital, I'm going to be giving you guys all of the tips and tricks around that. Can you reveal a little something selfishly as people who selfishly are raising exactly. capital and need that next level? Yes. Um, the biggest mistake that people make when they're starting out raising capital is they wait until they have a deal to start talking to investors and start raising that capital. Got do it. not do that. Do it before you have a deal because once you have a deal, it's too late. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. Now, and to go even more personal on what we're doing, we're doing well with just what we, we, we have that going on. Yeah. Like all these like pledges of like 50, 100K, whatever. Just great. How do we get into a $10 million deal? What's the difference besides maybe just obviously you know, the 
It, well, give me, give me like, been... what's, what's, what changed? How did you go from that to that? What was that bridge? So it really, it took a long time to get there and it's exponential growth. So one thing I would say is if you've already raised capital and you've delivered for your investors, and I overlooked this for the longest time, this is another big mistake I made. Go back to your investors. Every time you deliver good news, ask them for a referral and a testimonial. Yeah, Every he, he always I've says that. I've been trying yeah. to do yeah. that. I've built businesses based on that concept alone. It's yeah, I love, I love that. But Life the changing. referral, I didn't think of though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, ask them for a warm great. introduction. That's actually really, really smart. Yeah, it's the best way to build any business, whether you're getting like your residents, your short term rental renters, right. your investors, all of it. That's, a warm that's introduction is always better. That is such a great concept that I'm taking away from here selfishly that I really appreciate you. I've reiterated sure. a couple of times of that referrals. Like, just ask. Like, a good tenant. Hey, who do you know that might need a place? I've got something coming up in March. Yeah. Wow. That's cool. Um, my final question, by the way, and I'm going to give it off to Vince. Yeah. And, uh, we got to go. We, we got busy lives with meetings. I know. Um, on this cruise, how does Vina indulge? What are you planning on doing for fun? Oh, um, well, I love cruising. Like just in general, I yeah. love being on a cruise ship. I used to really love it because you couldn't get on the internet. And so it would be like forced disconnection from the digital world. Now, you know, you can get internet on everything. So that's gone out the window, but I just, I love cruising. I love the days at sea. I am a huge dork and I love trivia. So anytime <laughs> I get on a cruise ship, the first thing I do is I go to my calendar and I add all the trivias that are existing on the ship. What and topics to though? Any of them. Oh, she's I will go girl. to any of them. Um, I what like- was Ross Giller's first girlfriend's name? Oh, his first, friends. first <laughs> girlfriend. I'm trying to think. His first, it wasn't, oh... What was her name? I don't remember her or, name. Or, or his first wife who turns out to be a lesbian. Oh, that's Susan. Oh, dude, she knows the game. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you me. should know. I won on the last cruise I went on last month, I won the Friends Trivia all by myself. There were everyone had groups of like four to six, and I was just me. And I won. So that's what we're gonna do on Friday if you come see us in Long Beach at the <laughs> capital raising yeah. event. Do you guys want to get me to an event? Just tell me there will be trivia, like done yeah, signing. We party. Yeah, we could do it. Yeah, we have those trivia games. Hey, final I question. I know you guys, everybody has gotta go, but the market, so this is almost May 2023. Should people get into it right now or should they wait it out and then talk about it five years later how they messed up and didn't get in? Yeah, if you don't want to make money, you should wait. Yeah. Sure. But if you want to make money, like this is your moment. There are very few opportunities like the one that we are seeing now. Very mm-hmm. few. And you may never get this opportunity ever again in your life. Are the you- down cycle is where embarrassing amounts of money are made, not the bear or the bull cycle. The bear cycle is where it's way more impactful and way more life changing. Are you seeing the commercial prices adjust based on uh, any notes coming due and stuff? Or is it still, is, I see it's still priced pretty high. Yeah. Sellers still want 2021 pricing. Mm-hmm. Um, buyers obviously don't want to pay it. So the assets that have really great debt products on it are pricing really well still. The rest of them are like kind of waiting to see what exactly happens here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I know you have to go. Yeah. Um, any final, how do you, how do people get in touch with yeah, you? Yeah, plug yourself. How can we find um, you? Well, you can find me on social media, Vina Jetty, V-E-E-N-A-J-E-T-T-I, or you can join my Facebook community. It's free just to answer the questions. It's called Mastering Multifamily with Vina Jetty. Um, and if you want to come on the cruise, I think they still have tickets left. I'm not sure if it's sold out yet, but if you want to come, you can. Um, it's, I think, Teach Week Investor. And then... You put in either Vina or Vive, V-I-V-E. I can't remember which one, but one of those two will get you, I think it gives you like a free VIP upgrade. Nice. Oh, so yeah, I think yeah. it's it's on that Instagram post. So if you follow it her is. Instagram, you'll see the code word for the discount and all that stuff. And what's included. Yes. Yeah. And oh. I actually just launched a building your brand course, which is basically like putting together your whole brand into one easy package with like all the templates and everything. And I just launched a giveaway for it that someone who's enrolling in the course between now and I think like the end of the month 
um, they're being entered to get a free ticket and cruise on Teach Week. So I'm excited about awesome. that. Awesome. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. 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 We'll put some links to your uh, websites and stuff. But uh, let's hang out on a Friday. We'll have a good time. Let's do it for yeah. sure. The trivia on. Yeah. Thank you, Vina. Yes. Thanks, Thank Vina. You Appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I definitely like to see five star reviews on any service or any product before I purchase. Please take a second to leave us a five star review, whether you're listening to it on Apple, iTunes, or Spotify, or whatever platform. Take a second, goes a long way, helps us a lot to grow the channel, and thanks for listening.